Um, you know, I, I've had the experience to be working on this for quite a few years now, and I remember when I first started um, changing the habit of asking questions by, you know, calling on somebody in the way that I've always done it. It actually took me um, three or four years to get to the point where I felt like I was really smooth and good at it because it's a habit that has to be changed. I would write out my question on a card and I'd be ready to ask it and I'd ask that question and I'd smile at myself and then the next question out of my mouth is two plus two is, <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, oh, come on. And so really to change a habit to the point where you go, now I never ask a question, well, 99.9% .9 of the time I never ask a question that requires blurting or whatever, or ask the one kid that's gonna raise their hand. Um, you know, it took a lot of practice. It took a, it's a changing a habit. And so, but it's starting to change the habit. And the more we practice with it, the better we get at it. Um, so then one of the things in our effective question was that idea of point processing. And that's just the idea of we ask a question after every major point that we teach. You teach a point, you ask a question. You teach a point, you ask a question because we want them to interact with it. Um, we don't want to go on for 20 minutes about all the great things that we have to say because we know that every single person, including all of you at some point in the last 10 minutes has daydreamed and um, zoned out, come back in. If we're, give, if we're just speaking on and on and on and on and on and not doing any processing with it, we're gonna lose somebody and um, probably lose a couple of kids. So after every major point, we're gonna stop, we're gonna process it, we're gonna go back, teach some more, stop, process it. And it feels very slow at first that we're gonna stop in, after every major point, but it actually speeds things up and it actually makes learning um, more quality in our classrooms. So for example, if I'm standing up here like I did this week and I'm talking to my kids about how they're going to meet with their partners today in reading, and they're going to, when they get with their partners, they're gonna do a book recommendation. And you're gonna tell the, your partner all the reasons why you like this book and how they should um, how they should read it. And you know, I give them a little more on what a recommendation is. And then I ask my class, when the music starts, what might it look like in our classroom when kids are meeting with their partner and recommending books? What kind of things are we gonna see and hear going on in the classroom? So now they're processing what I just told them about they're saying it in their own words, they're talking about it, and um, so. And then I go back to, now I show them a little video clip of kids recommending books, and we go back to a little bit more on what recommending books is and looks like. And then I come back and, you know, one more time I ask them, you know, what did you see on the video, what did you notice about, and so after every time I do a chunk of teaching, I make a point, they talk about it and they process it, we come back, I teach a little more, they stop and they process it. So that's what point processing is, is after every major point, students process each point. With math, sometimes that point processing looks like we do a little something. And then I come back and I teach another point and we do a little something. I need to send some sort of interaction with that point. So some content, it's talking about it and explaining it, but some content I might be writing a something or I might be doing a something and then coming back to teaching a little more of it. So we just need to interact with every point. So when the music starts, what might be the benefits to a classroom? Why is it valuable to process a point after every major point? What might the benefits be to that? 